All right, with us today is Neville Ellis, who uh, is not located in the United States. Neville, tell um, folks where you're located and um, where you're doing your research. Well, I'm located in Perth, Western Australia, which is located on the southwestern tip of the Australian continent. And I'm doing my research, or I've just finished my research, um, looking at uh, climate change and mental health impacts amongst farmers in the West Australian wheat belt. Let's start first a little bit about your climate and what uh, what your weather is like and what are going what's going on and what maybe prompted this type of research. Yeah, sure. So the weather over here is um, it's known as a meta over here. So we've got uh, quite hot, dry summers and cool, wet winters. And it's during the cool, wet winters when um, farmers will uh, plant the crops. Um, and the growing season will extend from May through to October in that, uh, in that cool, wet part of the year. Um, what's been happening recently, however, is that we've experienced a significant drying trend, winter drying trend since the 1970s. So the West Australian wheat belt was once renowned as having the most reliable winter climates in Australia for broadacre agriculture. However, what we see today is something quite different. Not only have we lost upwards of one third of our winter rainfall in parts of the West Australian wheat belt, but we've also seen conditions become much more variable as well. So that's in terms of rainfall falling at different times of the year or not falling when it should be, more extreme weather events, um, but we're also getting more extreme temperatures as well. So heat waves and paradoxically with more frosts as well. So, and the other thing that your listeners need to know also about this part of the world is that this trend, this drying trend, this change in the climate hasn't been linear. The drying trend started in the 1970s and gradually got worse up until about 2000. And from 2000 onwards, things have intensified rather dramatically. In fact, um, things have got so dry over here that Perth's dams, so that's the major city over here, no longer supply water to the Perth um, metro area. Um, we've seen so much drying, in fact, that um, we're now completely dependent upon desalination um, and groundwater reserves. So that gives you an indication to the extent we've experienced a drying climate over here. And our farmers, because they're 100% dependent upon seasonal rainfall, are on the leading edge of climate change risk in this part of the country. When you look at the weather trends, and you mentioned it increased from the 70s to the 2000s, and we've seen an, an a substantial increase since the 2000s. Um, a lot of your research has been on how that weather and, and the change in the climate or climate change has affected farmers' mental health. So as we look at that, what were some of the things that you saw that maybe prompted this type of research? Well, to give a little bit of background, um, I guess you could sort of call me an environmental psychologist of sorts. I'm interested in how the environment affects people's emotional well-being and their psychological health. And so what we're seeing is that in different parts of the world, climate change is really starting to have an adverse impact on the mental health and well-being of people who retain close living and working relationships to the land. Most of this research has been conducted um, amongst Indigenous populations. For example, there's been research um, come out of Canada over the last few years, which has looked at climate change and mental health impacts. As you can imagine, the Inuit are, are people who have got very strong cultural, living, working relationships to land, but their landscape is one that's changing quite rapidly because of global warming and climate change. The sea ice is melting, the permafrost is melting, and it's causing all sorts of problems um, within the community and also presenting all sorts of mental health risks. Um, now, here in Australia, we've got this huge farming population um, that are also exposed to these climate risks. And even though there has been research looking at climate change and potential, potential health 
um, mental health impacts amongst our farmers. There hasn't really been a great deal of research done in this area, particularly from the way that I approach it, which is to look at uh, climate change impacts on farmers' sense of place and mental well-being. So a sense of place being people's emotional and psychological relationships to the land. And my big question was, well, if you're a person that's heavily invested emotionally and psychologically in that land, and that land is starting to degrade or be damaged by a changing climate, what does that do to your emotional health and your psychological well-being? As we look at your research in Australia, how do or what can farmers and people in the United States, you look at California that's been suffering from uh, a severe drought um, mm -hmm. for, for many years, and you look at the Midwest 2012, uh, the drought here in, in the Corn Belt, how can or what do American farmers and maybe American researchers take from the research that you've been doing? Well, there's, there's a few things that farmers and mental health practitioners can, can take away, I think. One of, the, one of the first things, and this is directed towards farmers, is to, is to be able to explain to farmers, I guess, the climate change risks um, presented to them. I don't know what it's like in the US, but, but here there's a certain level of uncertainty, um, if not scepticism, about the whole idea of human caused climate change um, and I think there's a, this uncertainty also feeds into uncertainty about the future so farmers here for example have observed these big changes in their in their local climates over the last few years um, but farmers are scratching their heads going well is this a cycle is it is it, is it going to get better next year or is this something that's going to continue on into the future? I mean, we, we just don't know. Um, so those climate change messages aren't being communicated very well to our farmers over here. Um, so one of the first things I would be saying to key agricultural government departments is that you need to be able to communicate climate change risks better to, to the farmers that are being affected. The second thing I would say, and this is off on a big tangent here, um, and again, I don't know uh, how farms are structured um, in different parts of America, but over here um, in our broad acre regions, what you find is that the house in which the farming family lives is situated right in the middle of the farm. And when you're inside the house, you can quite clearly see the paddocks, the farm, and the rest of the environment very clearly. And when it's green and lush, it's absolutely beautiful. But over here, because we've got this drying trend, more and more, the landscape has a tendency to dry out and become very vulnerable to wind erosion and other forms of degradation. And you can imagine that if you're a farmer and your whole life is wrapped up in that land, that's heartbreaking to see your land degrade like that. And it's even more heartbreaking if you go back home and go inside the house and you can still quite clearly see your land being degraded, your land blow away. So one of the things that came from my research was that because there's a very little geographical uh, lack of separation between the farm and the home environment, there's also very little psychological separation between the farm and the home environment. And what I would be encouraging farmers to do is to plant a garden or a green buffer zone around their house. So if things become degraded and become intolerable outside, that you have somewhere, a refuge to come home to. Because there are instances with the farmers that I was talking to where they were getting wind erosion, dust storms, and there's nothing to buffer them against that. They're coming home and the dust is coming in through the front door. You know, it's very emotionally distressing. And so that's where I think this idea of a buffer zone, um, it's just a really simple, practical idea that farmers can choose to employ. Um, and the third thing I'd be saying too, this is directed towards mental health practitioners, is don't underestimate 
um, the power of farmers' sense of place and the importance of their sense of place for the mental health and well-being. Over here, we found farmers um, willing to incur a great level of financial and, and emotional hardship to be able to stay on their land, even when it looked like they had no hope of financially recovering from their position. Um, and you also see, or what nurses and doctors were saying to me was that when the land becomes distressed, you can certainly see distressed farmers. And that's not just only because their financial positions are being eroded by, by these sorts of weather conditions, but also because the farm is a big part of their, big part of their emotional life as well. So again, if that land becomes degraded, you see many more stressed out farmers. And so mental health practitioners need to be aware of this relationship that farmers have with their land and that relationship that exists between the health of their land and their own mental health and well-being. Would you liken it to maybe like a seasonal effect disorder, but maybe intensified greatly because there is no escape from uh, what they're seeing every day? Well, it's interesting that you that you raise that that notion of um, seasonal affective disorder because one of the G well, one of the doctors that I spoke to servicing these rural communities likened it to a seasonal affective disorder, a seasonal affective disorder that was born out of a lack of rainfall rather than a lack of sunlight, and so he was saying that he could quite clearly see this pattern of of distress amongst farmers, particularly going into seeding where they're obviously having to make some very big financial decisions, they're working very long hours, and they're keeping an eye on the rain at this point in time. But with our drying climate, the rain just hasn't been falling. And so those stress levels really build at this time of year. And he was seeing this happen, happen year after year after year. And that's what he called it. He called it a seasonal affective disorder because of this lack of rain. So I think, I think that term, um, certainly hold some water. Let's talk a little bit about, um, you mentioned that farms, uh, the way that your farms are structured in uh, Australia, and on an average, what's this, what is the average size of, of a farm in your area? Well, out in New, well, the area that I was uh, researching, I think the average size was somewhere between, oh, it varied, probably around about 8,000 hectares, I would dare say. Um, do you operate in hectares or acres in the United States? We operate in acres. Oh, okay. I'm not sure how that how that translates over. Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to do that, uh, um, but I, I think it's like, I don't want to say. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> it's been a long they're, time they're in, in a hectare country. They're really big. They're really big farm operations. So there was one, for example, there was one um, farming family that I that I interviewed, and it, the father, who was doing most of the uh, most of the work on the farm, he also had a farm hand, and between the land that he owned and the land that he leased, he was operating an area uh, that had the equivalent size of I think it was fourteen thousand urban blocks, um, the average size of urban blocks in Perth. So it's just a staggering, staggering area of land. So they're not small farms. It's not, these aren't, oh, no. these aren't your hundred, what I would call like a hundred, 250 acre small farm. Oh, certainly not. These are big operations, definitely. And you also find that farms in Western Australia tend to be broad acre farms, at least tend to be bigger here than anywhere else. Um, in Australia as well, so they are they are truly huge. And the further east you go, the bigger they get. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess maybe to to kind of wrap things up, um, any any alarming statistics that that you saw from your research or, or your research pointed to? Um, anything else that we should know about before we let you go? Well, because I did qualitative research, I can't point to statistics. I was more um, uh, looking at farmers' lived experiences of climate change. There are a couple of things I'd like to add if, if we've got time. 
um, there's this term that was invented by my supervisor called solastalgia. And so what solastalgia refers to is this sense of being homesick while still being at home. And this term is being used greatly in the climate change community to talk about some of the um, emotional and psychological impacts of a changing climate on, on people's mental health and well-being. Um, now, solastalgia um, is, it sounds like nostalgia, doesn't it? But it's different. Nostalgia is, is what you feel when you're separated from a loved home environment. Maybe you've moved away from it. You've become homesick because you've been separated from a place that you know, you love, and you cherish. Solastalgia talks about this in place sense of distress or grief when you're living in this environment that you love and you're witnessing it degrade or transform in a way that you find distressing. And so what I found here is that um, our farms have become or seem to have become more vulnerable to dust storm events. And as I was talking about beforehand, you know, the farm is so much more than just a business. It's a way of life. It's a sense of identity. It's that continuation of family heritage. And if you've, if you've got wind erosion on, on your land, farmers see that as, a, as their own personal failings. They see themselves as bad farmers when that happens. Now, going back to what I was talking about beforehand with this lack of separation between the home and the farm environment, what I found was that farmers' wives were having to drag their husbands indoors, sit them down in front of a movie, close all the windows, all the curtains, and block them off from an outside world that had become far too distressing to watch. I even found a female farmer who uh, would take to putting herself to bed and putting the doona over her head so she just so she couldn't see what was happening outside. She found it so distressing. And that is a classic example of this notion of solastalgia, this homesickness that one feels while still being at home. So I thought I thought I'd just add that in um, at the end there, because that's something that's been um, that people have found interesting from this research and something that people are, could relate to. Um, if we've got, do we have one more minute? <laughs> yes, you have all the time. Okay, fantastic. One other thing, and I don't, and this might be interesting for for um, to see whether farmers in in the United States are experiencing this. But because our climate has become a lot more variable, a lot dry over recent years too, we've seen that our farmers have lost confidence in the predictability of the weather. And what that means is two things. One, farmers feel as though that they have no idea what's coming next year, next month, next week. And the other thing I found was that farmers' forecast checking behaviours have almost taken on a pathological um, bent, I guess, where I found some farmers were getting their phones out, checking five or six weather forecasts 10, 15 times a day. They literally will track storm systems as they emerge out of the Indian Ocean and as, as they sweep across the West Australian wheat belt. What's been happening, however, is they see these storm systems coming and their hopes and expectations rise. And the closer they get, the more the hope rises, the expectation rises. But then right at the end, just before they arrive, these storm systems will dissipate, break up and disappear. Um, and that's what I that's one of the biggest letdowns that farmers that I talked to had felt. They this this almost emotional roller coaster ride of of this boom bust cycle of hope and despair was really quite grinding for farmers to experience. I don't know if that's something that that farmers in the United States can can relate to, but certainly farmers here feel are much more sensitive to the weather, I think, than what they were beforehand. And also this weather checking behavior um, can cause a lot of stress as well. I would compare it very much to 2012. Um, and, and as a farmer's daughter who uh, works with my farm back home in Illinois, one state over, um, I went through the same thing. You, I have three or four weather apps on my phone and constantly watching 
uh, storm systems move in and break up and just basically split around the Corn Belt. It was a really tough. Right. It was really tough for farmers in 2012, and then we had a year this year where um, there were farms in Indiana and farms in the Midwest that had mass amounts of rain and uh, a lot of flooding damage too. So I, I know there's farmers in Southwest Indiana that lost 500 to 1,000 acres of corn from flooding. So I think I, I think that parallel that parallels where wherever you are and wherever you farm. Well, well, we we call me and my supervisor call that worry about the weather meteor anxiety. We've given it we've given it a, a name so we can direct people's attention to it. Uh, this this constant and chronic persistent worry about the weather, and um, yeah, I, I guess it's the same for for any farmer, isn't it? That who's livelihoods and lifestyles and cultures are dependent upon upon the weather one quick thing or one quick uh question just as we're talking about weather um in comparisons to where we are my weather this morning is cold and snowy here in the midwest and you told me uh your weather is is what well i, I don't know exactly what the conversion rate is but it's 42 degrees celsius over here so that's um i think it's around about 110 degrees Fahrenheit if not if not more and we're, we're experiencing a week of it so this this is our longest uh, uh, heat or February heat wave since 1933 I think it is um, yesterday was 42 degrees as well and tomorrow will be 40 degrees staggering how different it is yes Yes, it is. Um, I appreciate your time and uh, your your ability to uh, make this work so we can talk a little bit about this. Oh, well, thank you very much for your time. And um, yeah, it's it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. You too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.